name is Rod Rhys-Jones. I'm chairman of Friends of Imperial College, and I'd like to welcome you uh, to this lecture this evening uh, on uh, electrical propulsion of aircraft. Uh, before, I, well, <laughs> before I say any more, uh, just to go through fire drill, exit to the two doors at the back, or through here, turn left, to get out into the main area on the ground floor, go out through the same doors as you came in, and the gathering point is under the Queen's Tower in the middle there. If you can't get out through the doors for any reason, there is an exit at the back of the hall, uh, and you can follow the signs out uh, again into that space. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, two schools I've got uh, down this evening, Wilson School of Sutton, and Isaac Newton Academy of Ilford. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we always like to uh, have as our guest schools. Uh, they come for free. And if uh, any of you in the audience uh, would like to uh, help with the publicity to reach schools that you know of or where you've got uh, uh, children or grandchildren, uh, let us know and we'll try to uh, uh, get through to the school uh, because they're always uh, really welcome. Uh, Friends is... Uh, many of you know, is an independent charity uh, publicizing science uh, to the public and uh, in support of uh, Imperial College. Uh, we're particularly grateful for financial support from uh, as a IU, and indeed from our surplus at the end of last year, we donated uh, £5,000 to the President's Scholarship Fund. Uh, thank you for everybody's contributed. Well, Rick uh, Parker, uh, I'm delighted to welcome, although he's well known in the college as a visiting professor here. Uh, he studied physics, uh, his first degree here before going on to Loughborough University to take an MBA, and then uh, joining Rolls-Royce in, in 1978. Uh, he had a series of really intriguing and uh, exciting looking uh, roles in the company before he became Director of Research and Technology in uh, 2001, uh, responsible for uh, research uh, across all of the uh, uh, um, all, all, all of the Rolls-Royce uh, kingdom, if you like. Um, he recently retired, uh, but is devoting his energies to a number of activities, including looking at uh, uh, how uh, the, we can reduce the impact of, of aircraft on the environment. He was awarded a CBE in uh, engineering in 2000 for his contribution to engineering in 2013. He's a fellow of the Royal Society and a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and a number, number of other uh, engineering institutes. He's also a visiting professor at Birmingham and Loughborough. And with all that, we really are privileged to have him here this evening to talk about this subject. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rod, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first exposure to the Friends of uh, Imperial College, but uh, having seen uh, the menu of things they, they arrange, I shall stay much closer to it and hopefully uh, attend some other events on the, on the receiving side going forward. It's always a, a lot less nerve-wracking sitting out there than standing up here, I can assure you. Um, thanks for that introduction, Rod. Rod? plans these things way ahead. I think I've had this in my diary for nearly a year now, so he, he thinks a long way ahead about his program, and uh, I, I, I say I've been very pleased to do it, and, and it's a topic I uh, have come to learn a lot more about in the past year or so. I, I must admit, going back, not so recently, I was, I was a bit of a skeptic, but things are moving very fast, and we can certainly see a lot happening in this whole area of electrical technology. Uh, just a bit of the fine print before I go into the talk. Firstly, um, as Rod said, I'm, I'm a physicist. I always tell people I studied physics at Imperial College, 
and engineering in the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, but I'm predominantly a, an aeronautical and mechanical engineer, so I don't claim to be an electrical engineer, and there are probably some in the audience who know more about this subject than me. If I appear to dumb it down, it's not because I'm dumbing it down for the audience, it's because I'm dumbing it down so I can understand it myself. But uh, <laughs> you'll have to stay with me on that, and I'm sure you can... Uh, bring out through questions uh, what, what you know about the subject. So I, uh, uh, apologies for the pun vaulting into the air, but it seemed appropriate at the time. And uh, electrical propulsion has a lot to offer in the world of aircraft and is, as I say, an, a, a field that's uh, changing incredibly fast, and you'll see that from the talk. Um, I've been immersed in aeronautics one way or another, uh, since my early days, my father was uh, uh, in the RAF during the war and a pilot and retained a passion for aircraft and used to uh, take me off to Scampton Aerodrome to watch the local Vulcan squadron uh, uh, marshalling and getting up into the air. And then when I joined Rolls-Royce as a much younger man than now, uh, one of my early jobs, I was saying to one of your colleagues earlier, was uh, working on a cracking problem on the Concorde combustion can. And then as through my 15 years as Director of Research and Technology, I hopefully shaped a lot of the research to make today's engines for aircraft as efficient as possible and laid the course for the future to make them even more efficient and lighter so they did even less damage to the environment. Uh, and now in my dotage, the, the last picture, I can dream about electric flight and explain some of the problems to you with the joy of knowing I'm not the one who's got to fix the problems, it's somebody else's job now. So that's, again, quite a relief. Um, because this is looking into the future, you know, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about drones and toys and things you can buy today. Uh, I'm talking about when will we have an electric aircraft or will we ever have an electric aircraft big enough to take all the people in this lecture theatre at once into the air and off on their holidays somewhere. Uh, and that's really the exam question I've set out to answer. Now, somebody told me a long time ago that, uh, you know, talking, making predictions about the future is, is always difficult. And, uh, it's difficult in aerospace. One, Bill Boeing, who was quite famous back in 1913, when he, he produced a 12-seat aircraft, said the world would never see a bigger aircraft than this 12-seat aircraft. So he got it wrong. And even the, the very great and honorable Lord Kelvin, uh, he said this just back in uh, 1898, only five years before the Wright brothers did get a heavy in the air machine in the air, so he got it wrong. I think that the best general advice uh, I take from the physicist and mathematician Niels Bohr, who said prediction is always very difficult, but especially if it's about the future. So, so that, that's where I get my guidance from. Um, so this is roughly what I'm going to canter through in the next uh, 45, 50 minutes. Uh, why would we want to use electric power at all in the air? Why not just keep it for heating and uh, lighting our houses on the ground? Um, what are the different possible configurations we should look at and what are the, the devices that make up a, an electric propulsion system? Uh, what's the current uh, electric flight scene? And so that, that's the area I've done a lot of uh, digging into myself with some help from a couple of colleagues from Roland Berger, the, uh, uh, the consultancy company. I don't know whether they're in the audience. I didn't see them come in, but they, they have done a couple of excellent reports that if you go on their website, you, you can find on this subject from, I might say, more a business than a technical point of view. And then uh, what are the technical challenges that uh, all the clever people here at Imperial College and others have to get their mind around and try and solve? And then, as I say, try and answer this question Will we ever, and if so, when, uh, be able to fly a large number of people on an all-electric aircraft? And uh, then we shall, we shall come to an end. So, uh, with the first, why would we bother at all? Well, it's all about the environment at the end of the day. Uh, same reason we want electric cars and, and all sorts of other devices to replace carbon fuels. Um, this takes us back to the beginning of the jet age and Frank Whittle's first jet engine and the proportion of anthropogenic man-made CO2 that comes from air travel uh, sort of grew fairly rapidly because there wasn't any air travel at all, and the early aircraft were very inefficient. Um, and then it sort of leveled off, as you can see, and was growing at about the same rate as everything else, and today is only about 2.5%. So you might say, why bother? Let's just clean up uh, 
all these other things that produce CO2 and we can, we can let the poor old aircraft off the hook. They can produce as much as they like. Uh, the reason why not is in this graph, if you look at the growth of air travel, then it's set to continue upwards by a factor of six to eight over the, between now and 2050. And 2050 is the sort of date everybody looks like uh, for climate change and by which all the Paris agreements, the Kyoto agreement before that have to be delivered. So it's a good date to have in mind. And we can see that at the top of that curve, uh, if we did nothing at all, just actually continued improving at roughly the rate we have improved air travel, which is about 1% more efficient every year for the last 70 years, then we would still get to a point where it's, it's eight times worse. And if the rest of the world does what they're supposed to do to reduce CO2 from heating, from cars, from everything else, then aircraft CO2 will be a much bigger proportion of the whole. And at the end of the day, people will say, well, you shouldn't fly anywhere. And I, I personally believe flight is, is a great contributor to social well-being, to trade, to everything else. So I wouldn't want to see us restricting the amount of flying. And there are other countries that haven't yet caught up with Europe and the West in terms of being able to enjoy as much flight. Today, only 1% of the Chinese population fly uh, only once a year. Um, if, they, if you doubled that, if 2% of them flew once a year, that would double the total amount of flying in the world. So that's uh, something you think through. If they took two flights a year, they'd be a lot happier because they get home again. That would be even better for them. <laughs> and then... Um, we can look at uh, technology, and one of my jobs until the end of last year was chairing a big European program called Clean Sky, which was looking at all the technology we could marshal in Europe and do research on that would clean up air travel. And that's that sort of turquoise area. That takes you down, takes quite a bite out of it, but it still doesn't get down to where we need to do. Um, air traffic control is an interesting one. You could save 10% of all the world's aircraft fuel today without any new technology just by being able to fly from A to B in a straight line without circling around B for 15 minutes. And, and that would cure the world if you got rid of military restricted zones in airspace. And all these things that make planes take uh, a daft route or take too long, then flying would save 10% of its fuel, which is that thin orange band. But then today, all we can see that makes up the gap is some from biofuels and some from carbon trading, which at the moment... Uh, the main body, IATA, has nailed its colour to the mast and said we're going to be carbon neutral by 2020. Well, the only way airlines can, improve, uh, can achieve that is by buying credits so that other people can save CO2 on the ground, which, in my mind, is a little silly because it's taking money out of the industry. It's increasing costs of an industry that's fairly fragile, and that money could be going into better technology so you actually take the CO2 out in the air and not on the ground. So... That's one of the other reasons we need all this electrical technology to try and bridge that gap without just buying carbon credits. And this is from the work from uh, Roland Berger I mentioned. Uh, this is the report, uh, Think and Act, Aircraft Electrical Propulsion Onwards and Upwards. It's the second one they published, published one in 2017, one in 2018. Very readable, uh, quite understandable, and uh, it's available free on their website. You can download it and read it at home. This is part of what they did that backed up my previous statement. If you did nothing about that 2.5% that's aircraft-generated CO2 today and everybody else did what they're supposed to do, then in the worst possible world, then aircraft could be 24% of all the CO2 generated by mankind, which clearly would be uh, intolerable. Even in an accelerated curve, that, that sort of turquoise line, it still rises alarmingly above today. If we adopt enough electrical technology, simply because it makes good business sense, then we make a big uh, inroad into that. But ultimately, as with cars, it may take legislation. The British government said that by 2040, you won't be allowed to buy a petrol car or won't be able to buy a new car that's petrol driven. So they're pushing very hard for it all to become electric. This is what we've managed to do in Rolls-Royce, my own company with conventional technology over the Trent engine series back to 2000 until the very latest Trent engine, the Trent XWB that powers the Airbus A350. Uh, we've made serious inroads into uh, taking down 
fuel consumption and when you burn carbon-based fuel that's where the CO2 comes from but at the same time we're trying to manage oxides of nitrogen that come from frying the air and uh, you can't simultaneously get that right and at the same time everybody wants aircraft to be quieter so all these things are actually fighting each other and that to do an optimized design you could take CO2 down to the very minimum, but then the noise would go up and the, the, uh, the volume of uh, oxides of nitrogen, which are not a greenhouse gas, but they're pretty poisonous on the ground and not good to have in areas around airports. So good progress towards the targets we set ourselves back in 2000. We set some targets for 2020 and everything's coasting along nicely towards those. But the advanced targets going out to 2050 that are contained in a European document called Flight Path, 2050 really do need a step change in technologies, not just this evolutionary approach we've had up till now. So, so this gets a bit complicated, but um, we can think of a, a traditional aircraft efficiency in two ways, um, what we call the propulsive efficiency. So having got the engine to generate some energy, how effectively can you turn that into momentum change and push the aircraft forward? And within the engine itself, you've got a combination of burning the fuel, the thermodynamics, and the aerodynamic efficiency of all the components, and how efficient can you make those. So the product of these two gives you the overall efficiency of the aircraft propulsion system. And you can see that the, today's engines, a whole series of them, you can fit in this blob up here. And it would appear that we've got some way to go to improve even conventional engines. But then you have to add some constraints on that. Uh, this is what I was saying earlier, that these things are fighting against each other. If you go to the, uh, the, the bottom of the screen, you're getting better in terms of specific fuel consumption, FFC, and therefore generating less CO2. But NOx is getting worse because the engine's getting hotter and the pressure's going up. Uh, and so you, you don't want to do that. So if we went to the theoretical maximum we could achieve in efficiency by burning all the fuel fully stoichiometrically, we could make a significant improvement in efficiency. And if we had the best possible, it would actually be a propeller, funnily enough, not a, a, an enclosed fan like today, but an advanced propeller is even more efficient than an enclosed fan, but of course generates a lot of noise. So we, we could go to an advanced propeller, but ultimately the thing that's legislated, and until recently CO2 wasn't legislated at all, was NOx. And before you get anywhere near making the engine as thermodynamically efficient as it could be, you hit this limit where you cannot reduce the NOx because you're just getting the air, the, the very high pressure air now too hot, you're frying it, you're creating oxides of nitrogen. So there are limits to how far you can get, and you probably only get about 15% of that 30% theoretical efficiency gain from a gas turbine combustion engine. So we're running out of the ability to approve improve basic gas turbines. So what does electrical flight do for us? Well, it, it offers a number of possible benefits. Um, in terms of the aircraft itself, if you charged up a battery and then use that in the aircraft, the aircraft will produce no CO2. There's no CO2 given off by the battery. How you generated the electricity on the ground is critical, and that's just the same with electric cars. There are only two states in the whole of America today where you do less damage to the environment by driving an electric car instead of a plug-in hybrid because the electricity is so dirty in most of the states. So you're not, you know, if you drive an electric car in France, you're doing the world a favor. If you drive it in the UK, not so good. It depends on your source of electricity. And the same is true for electric aircraft or anything else. Um, Lower noise, because as I'll show, you can come up with different configurations that would be very difficult to achieve with conventional engines that allow you to distribute the power more evenly. You take away the hot jet uh, gas from the engine, which generates a lot of noise, and you can significantly reduce the noise. Um, in terms of capability, something I'll come back to is the way electrical systems actually enable a totally different thinking about the shape and size of an aircraft. We've already seen this in the marine world. A modern ship, uh, in the old days of ship design in the past, you had a big motor that had to live in the middle of the ship somewhere, and you had a propeller that had to be in the water underneath the back of the ship. And it was called in, in marine design circles the tyranny of the shaft line. The shaft joining those two, which had to be one very long and continuous piece of metal, 
for efficiency reasons, couldn't go downwards at more than five degrees. So the whole shape, size, and length of the ship was determined once you pick your power plant and your propeller. Zoom forward to today in the Type 45 destroyer. You've got a gas turbine generating electricity, and you've got an electric motor sitting right next to the propeller. And you can put those wherever you want on the ship. It's useful still if the propeller's at the back pushing the ship forward rather than the other way around. But you can put it where you want. So you suddenly liberate the, the designer. You can have ships of a radically different shape to today. You can actually get at the generators and things much easier for maintenance. And the same, I can guarantee, will happen in aircraft as we start things through. And you'll see some of it is happening already. And then from a safety point of view, you can have... It's much easier to make designs with multiple power units if you're, you're electrically driving them, which may, one particular example I'll show you has 18 separate motors on it and, and still flies successfully. And they've calculated that six of those could go out and you still have enough lift to land safely and, and uh, do whatever you need to do. And actually electrical systems by and large are more reliable than, than conventional mechanical systems. There are fewer moving parts and, and you can generally make them last longer. And we're seeing that already with, uh, with electric cars. So let me just quickly explain the, the building blocks of these electrical systems. Uh, we start off with a way of generating the electricity. For this purpose, I've assumed it's still a gas turbine, whether that's on the ground or in the air flying alongside it. We attach a generator to that, so we generate some electricity. We then take that through a battery, so we charge up the battery. We can store the electricity. and into a motor that turns the electricity now back into motive power and then we turn a propeller or a fan just as we do today. Uh, but to make all that work, you have to have some very clever electronics because you go through that chain, you're hopping from AC to DC, some voltages are higher than others and all that's got to be managed effectively and efficiently and you need cables to transmit what's actually a very large amount of power around inside the, the aircraft. So all that has to come together and you can have various configurations to do that. The simplest is the pure electric system, like a, a Tesla car. You have a battery, you plug it in when it's on the ground, and then hopefully you remember to unplug it when it takes off, and uh, you've got a fully charged battery, and the distance you can fly on the, with the motor driving a fan or a propeller is just determined by the size of the battery uh, you put in there and, and the total weight of the aircraft you're trying to get off the ground plus its passengers. So that's a nice simple system that has the advantage that it's a sort of one shot and if the battery doesn't hold enough power then, or enough energy you, you won't get to where you want to get to. A uh, simpler, uh, more complicated system, more like the sort of Toyota Prius car are, are what are called... Uh, series hybrid electrical propulsion system. So in these, you have one leg of the system that's generating electricity actually on the plane, a gas turbine, turning a generator, and then you have a battery as well. Now you don't need such a big engine because the engine doesn't have to provide all the power for the aircraft, particularly on takeoff, which is when you need a lot of energy and a lot of power. Then you can take some of that from the battery and some of it from the engine. So you actually shrink down the engine in these hybrid uh, aircraft Again, you drive a fan or a propeller or a whole set of them. Um, you can actually also keep the engine running uh, efficiently and use it to recharge the battery. So in an ideal system, you wouldn't ever need to plug in your aircraft on the ground and wait for it to charge up again. You'd land with a fully charged battery and be ready for the next flight. So that would be a good system. That's still a hybrid system, just a small change to it. There's also what's called a parallel hybrid system, which is a bit more complicated, but easier to adapt to more conventional architectures because you have an engine producing mechanical drive and you have an electrical system producing mechanical drive. And so if you want to modify a system that's just mechanical drive today, you can sort of see ways of doing this without having to tear up the whole architecture. Uh, the disadvantage is you've now got this gearbox that has to do fancy things to share the power between the electrical, electrically generated power and the power from the engine. So it's not, uh, not ideal. And then finally, you've got a turboelectric propulsion system, which at first sight doesn't seem to make much sense at all. I've got an engine that's capable of driving the aircraft, and now I've put two lossy elements between the engine and the thing that's going to drive the aircraft, the fan or the propeller. I've put a generator in there that's only 80% efficient, and I've put a motor in there that's only 80% efficient, so I've thrown away a lot of energy. Why would I bother doing that? 
you wouldn't if it just looked like this. But if in that example where I want to drive 18 separate rotors from one generator and one gas turbine, this becomes much easier to configure because I just need wires to those 18 uh, motors rather than having shafts, 18 shafts coming off a very complicated gearbox. So there are some cases where you might even consider uh, this system. So electric flight, what's happening out there today? As I said, I'm not going to deal with toys, camera platforms, or small unmanned air vehicles. This is all about aircraft even today that are capable of carrying one, two, three or four people and are powered partly or wholly by electricity. And this is, as I said, so where's it going to happen first? Well, it's probably going to happen for fairly short journeys. And one of the areas that's getting a lot of interest is the so-called air taxi. You hear this phrase uh, considerably, and not surprisingly, uh, one of the people sponsoring development of air taxis is Uber, who bought into and, and supported at least five different companies that are trying to develop an air taxi. One of those companies, I was reading only today on the, on the internet, was claiming that you'd be able to take an air taxi to your destination, get there much quicker for the same price as an Uber on the ground. Now, I think that's a bit of a tall order to think through, but they're claiming that you'd be able to do that many more rides with the air taxi because you wouldn't get stuck in traffic that uh, you could bring the economics down. I'll believe it when I see it, but it may happen. But airports of the future could look very different, or you may not need an airport at all. You just land in the nearest piece of ground if it's vertical takeoff or helicopter-like uh, and so on. So air taxis are likely to be the, the early, one of the early applications of electric technology. They're fairly small, and you need to carry two or four people. And uh, this particular one is a, a concept. It doesn't exist today, a concept from Rolls-Royce that they've developed for what an air taxi might look like. And the, you'll see in a minute there are lots of variants on this. Going back to the Roland Verger study, they did this study over the last two years, and I've, I've helped them with this where they've looked at all the projects they can find out in the world that are developing sensible electric aircraft, as I say, capable of carrying people. And uh, I noticed only today when I was reviewing the slides that the left-hand column doesn't add up to 100%. My apologies for that, but uh, that aside, the rest of the data I, I can vouch for. Um, the uh, breakdown, as you see, uh, even today, the projects under development, air taxes are a large part of that, Regional aircraft are another part, uh, general aviation, you know, aircraft just for one or two people to fly in, either for sport or, or for fun. And small regional aircraft make up a very small proportion, and bigger commercial aircraft are sort of dreams that aren't happening. Uh, in Europe uh, and America, there's a lot of activity. The rest of the world, fairly quiet at the moment. Um, Battery-powered makes up a lot of it. Hybrid, part battery, part gas turbine, make up the rest, and uh, a couple of interesting solar-powered projects out there that I'll just touch on because they're quite fun. And most of them have propellers. Some of them have ducted fans, which are better from a noise point of view, and then there are other forms of propulsion. But the interesting thing is, is the companies involved. So there were something like 134 when I looked last night, and it changes almost daily. When they published the report last year, it was only 100 live projects, or 134 live projects today developing these aircraft. And the amount of investment they attract is, is incredible. You know, I, I picked the wrong business to go into. Getting money for conventional aircraft is very, very difficult. Getting money for, for some of these ideas, some of which are very credible and may earn money, some of which are not so credible, uh, seems to be incredible. But um, over half of the projects are led by people who didn't exist as a company five years ago, let alone were established aircraft manufacturers. Um, the aerospace primes are only 16% of the total. Other people who've been involved in aerospace and decided they could turn their hand to uh, uh, whole aircraft systems are another 10%. And then some of them are driven by individual universities who've got their own projects going in America, and NASA has one or two projects running as well. So it's an interesting field, and this just shows how it's grown. This is uh, 2009, as I say, when they published the report last year uh, in time for the Farnborough Air Show. It was around 100 projects, and it's updated... Uh, the counts updated um, weekly on, on the internet 
So you can go in at any time and see which the projects are. And it's 134 uh, as of last night. So really incredible. And this is rather fun. That anybody who does get interested in this and wants to play with it some more, you can go on to the Roland Berger website and you can pull up this map of the world that shows you where all these projects are. And uh, the, the, you can see the US and Europe about the same. And then one or two. China not playing much at all at the moment, but I'll come back to that in a minute. I think they will wake up rather quickly. And when they do, they may have uh, quite an advantage for other reasons. So you can zoom in, you can blow up Europe and have a look where the projects are. And you can click on an individual project and find out some facts about it and actually go to a, a further link to the project's own website. So it's all rather fun and uh, certainly for uh, any young school people out there who are interested in electric flight, it's a, it's a great way to pass a, a Saturday morning fairly, uh, fairly interestingly romping around the world. And you can zoom right in. This is Bristol. So there are three live projects today down in Bristol and a number of others in the UK. So I'd commend that to you. Uh, so if we just look at some of those projects, and I picked them fairly randomly, uh, a lot of them are air taxis, but uh, this one, uh, the Airbus Vahana, little spin-off company that Airbus set up themselves in California uh, called the A3. And this is a tilt rotor. So the wings swing when it goes from vertical flight to horizontal flight. Has, um, sorry, just uh, pull the notes together, eight propellers on that and has a, a range of about 100 miles, uh, 100 kilometers. And all of these projects are not, most of them that I'll show you are not just pure paper concepts. They've either had their first flight already or they're scheduled to have their first flight between now and 2020. So they're, they're imminent real projects, if I can put it that way. Um, the next one, appropriately called Kitty Hawk, because those of you that know your aerospace history will know that Kitty Hawk was where the Wright brothers made their very first flight in uh, 1903. So... Uh, this project uh, is called Kitty Hawk, or the company is called Kitty Hawk, and the aircraft's called Cora. A little more like a conventional aircraft with one propeller on the front, but uh, a large number of, of propellers, 12, generating the vertical lift and enhancing the vertical lift so it doesn't need to take off uh, from a long runway. The next one is one of the ones that uh, Uber are sponsoring, and you see their badge on the wing. This is a company called Carem. And again, it's a, a, a battery-powered aircraft, all battery, uh, fairly... Uh, they haven't declared the range yet, so I couldn't find a range for that one. Two propellers and again a tilt rotor, so the wings swing upwards when you want to go vertically and land or take off, and then when you're doing forward flight, they, they go horizontal. There are systems like that already to do today. There's a military aircraft, the V-22 Osprey, conventionally powered and has tilt rotors, but actually quite difficult to engineer with conventional engines and drive systems and things. Much easier, for the reasons I said earlier, to do it electrically. Uh, then this one is a good, an interesting example. Workhouse are actually not an aerospace company at all. They're, they're a truck company in America, and they suddenly decided they would uh, turn their hand to uh, developing aircraft. This one's a hybrid. It's got a small uh, pet uh, petrol engine in there, actually, not even a gas turbine, uh, and a battery and has um, how many rest, uh, eight, eight propellers in four opposed pairs uh, as you go up. So, again, interesting one. This one I rather like. This is rather futuristic looking. Uh, it's called the Opener Blackfly, and this, again, was a company that didn't even exist five years ago, and they've just done their first flight test of, of this aircraft. And uh, those of us of a certain age, and I look around the audience and spot a lot of people as the same certain age as me, I'm sure you can't look at this picture without it conjuring up a memory from your childhood uh, uh, of this. Now, that wasn't an electric car, funnily enough, an uh, electric plane. We didn't think uh, flying cars would be electric uh, back uh, 50 years ago, but uh, 55 years ago. Uh, but uh, it was actually a, a jet-powered aircraft uh, or car, flying car. But uh, nonetheless, I say it came to mind when I looked at that. So uh, this one's an interesting one. Uh, sorry, it gone too far. I was clicking and moving at the same time. This is a company called Li Lift Aircraft, and they've developed this little hexa, little one-seater. Uh, it's, it's almost like a flying mobility scooter, if I can put it that way. But, <laughs> and, 
and it's designed purely for, for fun. The idea is they're going to have it in, in, you know, in Disneyland and in uh, uh, nice open scenery, so you can just rent one for a few hours and, and poodle around and have a look at the scenery uh, after, I hope, a few lessons. Although one of the worrying things is, uh, under American law is that this comes into what they call their ultralight category, where you don't need any uh, certification for the aircraft and you don't need a license to fly it. So uh, be careful where you, where you go in America if too many of these are around. You may find lots of well-meaning amateurs. Uh, my wife got run over by a lady in a mobility scooter when we were in Orlando recently, so uh, God knows what happens if they're in a flying mobility scooter. <laughs> Uh, and this one I will come back to because it's a really interesting one. It's one of the larger projects out there. It's a hybrid, it's not pure electric, but it's aimed initially at a 12-seater aircraft. A little company called Zunum. The very credible design, and Boeing have now bought a, a fairly sizable slice of Zunum, so Boeing think it's a credible design as well, and they've got some pretty good aeronautical engineers. And I say, I'll tell you a bit more about that. NASA got in on the act. This is a, a battery-powered system with, again, large number of rotors. So it only uses the rotors on the wing for uh, the, the, the 12 or so in the middle for takeoff. Uh, and the rest of the time they shut down, actually the, the rotors fold out the way and you just fly using the two uh, motors on the, on the far end of the wings. But again, uh, a nice concept from NASA. Uh, this is back to Rolls-Royce. So Rolls-Royce have launched a very interesting project, an all-electric battery-powered aircraft that they're going to try and, and develop here in the UK. They're going to try and set the, the first airspeed record for uh, a, a, a battery-powered aircraft, and uh, they're aiming for 300 miles an hour. Now, when you think that the top speed of a Spitfire during the Second World War was 364 miles an hour, we're going backwards, not forwards, but to do it electrically is nonetheless challenging to get up to that sort of speed and maintain that sort of speed for any, any difference. So this is a project called Axel, and it's scheduled to have its first flight in 2020. And then the solar stuff. Um, interesting. This was a, a project called Helios that uh, NASA launched. This is the fourth and final variant of Helios. Uh, the wings were something like uh, 100 meters long and covered in uh, solar cells, and it could only just then get the aircraft into the air. It did have a small fuel cell on board as well as a sort of auxiliary, uh, auxiliary power pack powered by hydrogen, uh, but it certainly couldn't carry a passenger or carry a person. And then there was another project. Some of you may have seen this. It got a lot of publicity. This was the first solar-powered aircraft to fly all the way around the world. Now, there's a saying in my industry that no sane man should fly more than halfway around the world, and I tend to believe that, but uh, the, the two gentlemen who intermittently flew this, it took them many, many days to uh, fly around the world. Average speed, I think, was something like 30 miles an hour, top speed about 60 miles an hour, uh, and uh, only one of those two pilots was in the plane at any one time. They had to get special certification to fly a single pilot, and uh, very brave people, particularly the... So it had a sort of computer-based um, co-pilot. Uh, but just as they were about to do the longest leg of the trip, which was from uh, Nova Scotia over to Hawaii, um, the co-pilot packed up. And the, the pilot said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So he flew continuously for five days and nights with his fellow co-pilot and a trained psychologist on the ground trying to keep him awake and help him get through that uh, without going totally mad. Very, I, I did meet the, uh, the pilot who did that leg. I met him in Germany last year. Fascinating guy. Uh, nutcase by some people's standards, but, but a fascinating guy and, and very, very brave man. But again, not really, I mean, apart from setting, I think they set about 15 different world records in, in doing that flight. Uh, apart from doing that, you, you really wouldn't see this as a practical form of transport. Now, if you want to run a satellite system or a television system, why send up satellites when you could have an aircraft like this continuously circling the globe, doing reconnaissance, doing uh, maintaining satellite systems, that may be a sensible future for a solar-powered aircraft. If you can generate enough power during the day and store that so you can fly on through the night, why not? And uh, so I, th I think it could be credible uh, for other reasons, but certainly not for, for man's flight. So 
that's, as I say, just where we are today. It's a snapshot of that 134 projects. There are lots more in there if you want to go and look at them, but I think it's a representative cross-section. So where's it all happening in cars today? Because that's a critical technology. Cars will drive a lot of the battery and electric technology we're going to need for air travel. Uh, but how fast? Well, you can see that, that the... You know, there's virtually no impact in Europe or even the USA, despite the, the Tesla hype uh, for electric cars today. The majority of cars are still traditional cars. And even by 2030, that Europe's legislating to make a lot more cars electric. And also, in, in countries like Norway, they have huge incentives. If you buy an electric car, you can charge it for free on the streets. You pay no road tax, etc., etc. Uh, but... Um, America, a little slower than Europe, but the one to watch is China, all petrol today. They're going to have twice as many cars in China as there are in the whole of America by 2030, and the vast majority of those will be electric cars, and, and that's a very interesting. And if you then project forward who might be leading the world in electric aircraft in uh, 20 years' time, then it might not be the Americans or the Europeans, it might well be the Chinese. And just in terms of the amount of a lot of this technology is actually homegrown in China. They're one of the biggest producers already and developers of batteries for cars, uh, and that's uh, going to take them a long way forward. So it's both a threat and an opportunity as we look forward. So what are the technical challenges? Why, why aren't we doing even more than I've just shown you already? It all comes down to the battery is the critical thing. The battery is the most difficult bit to get right. Uh, whether it's a hybrid system or an all-electric system, you're going to need a battery in it to store some of the power. And kerosene is actually, that's the stuff we fly aircraft on today. It's a liquid fuel, uh, not totally dissimilar to petrol, but more efficient and effective than petrol. And it also doesn't catch fire quite as easily, which is a good thing. But uh, this is in terms of megajoules of electricity or equivalent uh, for a kilogram of fuel. And you can see that kerosene is pretty effective, and uh, for a litre of fuel, you get 37 megabytes, um, 32 megajoules. So if you think about trying to charge an electric car, where it's going to take you 15, 20 minutes at a service station to charge your electric car at 30 to 100 kilowatts, when you put that petrol pump in your car, you're charging the car at 5 megawatts. And just remember that. That's the difference already. That uh, it takes you about 5 seconds per litre to charge a car. So it's 5 to 7 megawatts of energy you're loading into a car when you stand at the petrol pump. Um, some of the other things, people say, why don't we just fly using hydrogen? Then we wouldn't have any CO2. It just produces water vapour. And that's a perfectly sensible statement and a, and a correct statement. And from... Uh, a, a, um, a mass point of view, then liquid hydrogen for the same amount of energy is a lot lighter than kerosene. The, the problem is the volume. You've got uh, three times the volume of fuel to fly the same distance uh, if you use hydrogen, which means that most of the place that's currently taken up by passengers, in addition to all the fuel tanks, would be full of fuel, and, and that doesn't actually achieve the objective of having uh, a passenger-carrying aircraft. But you could do it, and there are proposals for hydrogen-powered aircraft. Uh, liquid natural gas is interesting. We could fly on LNG. It's better than kerosene in terms of uh, its uh, power density, uh, but it's worse in terms of volume. So for a given-sized aircraft today, and it wouldn't be very difficult to convert an aircraft of today to fly on liquid natural gas compared to kerosene. You need the, the, the tanks to keep the gas cool and under high pressure, but that would be it. Um, but you would only fly about two-thirds as far on the same tank full of fuel as you would with kerosene. So disadvantage. Uh, just for a bit of a laugh, I've put uh, nuclear in there. So there have been serious proposals over the years for nuclear-powered aircraft. I think the, the public's even more nervous about people flying with nuclear than they are flying with hydrogen. But uh, nonetheless, it does have big advantages. So uh, 80 trillion uh, watts of electric, watts of uh, joules of, uh, of energy per kilogram of uranium. You don't need much uranium uh, to fly an aircraft. But when you look at batteries today, they're way down here. So normally people quote battery uh, power density in, in watt hours per, uh, per kilogram. 
and that ranges from about 100 watt hours per kilogram to 250 watt hours per kilogram. So they're much, much heavier for the same amount of energy compared to just a tank full of, of uh, kerosene. So that, that's the big advantage, uh, disadvantage. So how far is technology going to be able to push that? That's what I'll come back to. Uh, it's not just the batteries. Everything on the electric aircraft, if it's going to work at size, has to be much lighter than today for the same amount of energy. So the, the batteries I've talked about, the motors and generators, the power electronics, all have to improve by a factor of two, three, or even four compared to today's systems. Otherwise, the aircraft's just going to get too heavy to get off into the air, or if it does get off into the air, it won't be able to take any passengers because it'll be so heavy without the passengers. Even the cabling joining the electrical devices together this is, this is copper today. Copper is incredibly heavy, but we have to transmit very large amounts of power uh, down these cables, so copper is the best thing we know for doing that. It may be that we can make use of graphene, which is a very good conductor, and create something called ultra wire uh, that allows you to have a much more conducting cable for the, for the weight, uh, and, uh, but that's still a little way off, and then people have been talking about using carbon nanotubes uh, in various configurations as well. So everything's got to get better if you're going to go from the sort of electrical systems we use today to something that could power a sizable aircraft. So those are the, a summary of the technical challenge. Safety is going to be uppermost. I mean, people will remember, it was only two or three years ago, that one of the world's most electric aircraft, the Boeing 787, had a lot of trouble with the batteries catching fire. And ultimately, they still haven't, fundamentally solved the problem. They've just put the batteries in a big titanium box with a vent to the outside world. So if it does catch fire, it doesn't set fire to the rest of the aircraft. Fortunately, it's not an all-electric aircraft, so even if the battery's not working, uh, the kettles in the galley might not work for a while, but the aircraft will still safely get to the ground. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, cooling's an issue. If you're going to charge and discharge a battery with tens of megawatts, and it's only 90% efficient in that cycle, yeah, for each 10 megawatts of electricity you get out, you get one megawatt of heat, which is going to go somewhere. You've got to cool that battery. You've got to get rid of the heat out of the aircraft. Uh, control systems are a challenge. And corona discharge. If you Aircraft tend to fly fairly high up where the pressure isn't the same as on the ground. So at around 32,000 feet, where an aircraft normally flies, then if you take the voltage on a cable above... 700 volts, that cable starts to glow very nicely. And if there's anything within that glow, it shorts across to it. So you've got to protect the cables, either by keeping the cables in their own pressurized environment, which gets heavy and complicated, or by lots of screening and unearthing around the cables. We would like to go up to 4 kilovolts or 6 kilovolts, because transmitting electricity at these high voltages is much more efficient than transmitting uh, at the sort of low voltages we use on aircraft today, typically 440 volts uh, in the air. And then the components themselves, I've talked about batteries, the machines, the cables, the connectors. You've got to hook these things together, and even with instrumentation connectors on aircraft, the sort of thing you plug into your iPhone could easily do the job, but you have to design it so that at minus 40 degrees, a fitter with full gloves on can still undo it or do it up again. And, and uh, that's what makes them big, chunky things. When you look at a modern control box on the aircraft, the connectors take up about 80% of the volume. The actual electronics inside are, are minute. Um, and we need the power, the power electronics to be intelligent, to be fault tolerant, so if one thing packs up, it doesn't take the, the whole system down. And then there are other non-technical challenges, legislation. Are we going to allow these aircraft to fly? You know, the current certification rules don't apply to these new aircraft types, uh, and what's going to be required to certify them? Air traffic control, we've got hundreds of these flying mobility scooters scooting around, then somebody's got to keep track of them and uh, try and stop them uh, interfering with each other. Uh, working in city centres, where you've not only got lots of little aircraft, but you've got cars and buses and other things that uh, may decide they want to go where the aircraft's about to land. Uh, landing sites themselves, airport design, single pilot operation. Most aircraft today, except by special uh, permission, have to have two fully trained pilots on board to fly the aircraft. Uh, if you're going to fly electric aircraft that are very small anyway with only a single pilot, 
Uh, are you going to be able to certify for that? And what happens if the pilot has a heart attack or something happens, unfortunately? So finally, is it ever going to happen? I hope I made it sound too gloomy, but there are some huge electrical, uh, some huge challenges out there. And I say Imperial College is exactly the sort of place that has all the right skills and boffins to, to tackle these issues for the future. But can it ever really happen? So we can do a lot with electricity without even flying the plane on. If you look at a conventional aircraft, there are lots of different power systems. We use pressurized air from the engines. We use electricity generated by the engines. We use mechanical drive from the engines to turn other things. And we drive hydraulic pumps that then pump heavy hydraulic fuel fluid all over the aircraft to drive other, other systems. So just going from a conventional aircraft to one where, never mind the propulsion, let's just make everything else electrical because that will simplify it. So you can go to an aircraft that doesn't need just has fuel and the electric start and doesn't have all these other outputs. It just gives out thrust from the engines and electricity for all the systems. And you can start to simplify the aircraft and do away with what's called the ram air turbine, which is there in case all the electrical systems shut down on the aircraft and it actually works by the air sweeping past the aircraft being taken through a turbine, generates just enough, enough electricity to be able to maintain control of the aircraft and land safely. Uh, it doesn't get used very often, thankfully, but when it does, it seems to work. And the, the cabin air system, that's a very expensive and difficult system to operate. So you take hot pressurized air from the engine, you then put that through, cool it, put it through a, a, a turbine, to generate the pressure and the, the circulation of air inside the cabin. With an electric aircraft, you can just use a fairly standard air conditioning system, and, and you have the advantage that the air can be circulated, you can pressurize where you want, and the air has never been anywhere near a smelly, noisy, or oily engine. So you have nice, clean air always inside your cabin, and not some that's had a connection with the, the engine. Uh, and that's not the future, that's happening today. This, this is the Boeing 787, the world's most electric aircraft today. I, I would almost say all electric, but it's not quite, but very close to it. Uh, this is in the British Airways livery, but there are a lot of them out there, over a, a thousand aircraft already flying. And uh, it has lots and lots of electrical system. The cabin air pressurization is done electrically. The only bit of the system, and uh, all the flaps and actuators that are normally done hydraulically or mechanically are powered by electricity. The only bit of the aircraft that they still can't work out how to do electrically is to deploy and retract the undercarriage. It, it just isn't a, a powerful enough electric system. But even there, what they do is generate the hydraulic force right next to the undercarriage from an electric motor. So they, they have a hydraulic reservoir that they charge up with an electric motor, and then when you need to drop the undercarriage or take it back up again, you use the, the hydraulic force uh, rather than the electric. So it's an amazing aircraft, beautiful aircraft to fly on. It's pressurized to a, a higher level than a conventional aircraft, so you, you're flying along at 6,000 feet instead of 8,000 feet, and jet lag is about half altitude sickness and half time disorientation. So if you take away some of the altitude sickness elements of that, and I have done a very long flight on the 787 Kyoto to San Francisco, and I must say I felt a lot fresher uh, when I came off. And even again, without totally replacing the, the propulsion system electrically, you can do things to enhance the propulsion. So when you pass the air over the outside of an aircraft, it generates what's called a boundary layer that gets thicker and thicker and thicker, and when that eventually spills off the back of the aircraft, it causes drag that's trying to slow the aircraft down, so you use more fuel to overcome that drag. Now, if you put a big electrically driven fan right at the back of the aircraft, the boundary layer that's got thick by here suddenly gets sucked into this fan, recompressed, blown out the back as a source of propulsion now rather than a source of drag, and you save about 5% of the fuel uh, you would have used, even allowing for the extra weight of this fan and everything else. So again, that could be powered needs a few megawatts of power that could come from the main engines. And again, serious studies done by Rolls-Royce and Airbus and, and others to, to look at this. But if we want to go to the nirvana of having an all-electric aircraft that would carry the same number of people as a Boeing 787, 270 people, then this is what you're up against. A, a flight to New York and back uses about 80 tons of aircraft fuel today. 
um, 70,000 litres of fuel and generates 264 tonnes of CO2, just one journey to New York and back. So more or less one tonne of CO2 for every passenger on that plane. And that, that brings, I think, the, the problem into stark reality. Less than those same passengers would, if they all took a car and individually travelled the same distance, they'd generate twice the amount of CO2 as that aircraft does. It's actually very efficient in terms of the number of miles travelled and the, the amount of people it can carry, but nonetheless, it's not acceptable. So we look at all these other things. Uranium's great stuff. I, I love nuclear, but uh, not everybody shares that, that passion. <laughs> but you, you can power that whole aircraft with just 40 grams of uranium to go to New York and back, you know, instead of 80 tons. Wonderful. Admittedly, nuclear power plants get a bit heavy in their own right, irrespective of the fuel, but uh, it could be fun. Hydrogen, as I said earlier, looks good. Liquid natural gas, you do get some benefit. You, liquid natural gas does not produce as much CO2 per unit of energy as liquid fuel. So uh, you can save, even if you're burning the LNG on the aircraft, you're saving on CO2 compared to a petrol-driven aircraft. But if we want to do it with a battery, we've got 10 times the weight of battery compared to the weight of fuel. Now, admittedly, the battery is self-contained. The fuel's got to live in a fuel tank, so you've got to add in the weight of that. But you're still out by a factor of five or six. And this is not just today's battery. As projected forward, the physics of a lithium, uh, physics and chemistry of a lithium-ion battery, to say what you know, what are the fundamental limits? And people agree that know more about this than me that the fundamental limit is about 500 watt-hours per kilogram, about two and a half times uh, what we can achieve today. So that's the best possible lithium-ion battery you could ever have, and it's still 10 times too heavy for an aircraft that size. Um, you get zero CO2 if you charge it up on the ground and then fly with it. Uh, I did do the sums to look at what happens if you actually burn CO2, burn a, you know, so this, this assumes zero CO2. If it wants it through the cycle, you have to assume that the electricity was generated by solar power or windmill or something. If, if you generated, if you took off in this electric plane from Germany where the... Uh, the, the, the electricity, certainly in the, in the former East Germany, is generated largely by uh, brown anthracite, which is very dirty stuff. Then you do twice as much damage to the aircraft using electric-powered aircraft uh, as you would uh, to the environment as you would uh, using the, the kerosene-powered aircraft. But if you had nice, clean fuel like liquid natural gas, even on the ground, and you burnt that in a generator to charge up your battery, you still make a, a small saving relative to the kerosene. So there are reasons for wanting to do it, but as a pure electric aircraft, as I say, we, I've looked at the absolute limits. You could probably get to twice this limit with novel battery technologies that are being talked about. One of the problems there is, yes, you can get the energy density where you want it, but most of those new technologies, you can't get the power out fast enough, particularly solid-state batteries. They, you can hold more energy per kilogram of battery but if you want to pull that power out at 50 megawatts, it's not going to happen. The, the, the whole battery will explode if you try and do that. So uh, there are good reasons why it's unlikely to happen. And the, <laughs> the, 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 this, they always say one picture's worth a thousand words, and, and this is a great example. This was NASA's view of what the flying large aircraft would look like. Yes, it would fly, uh, but there wouldn't be room for pilots, passengers, or anything like that. It would just be a, a battery with wings, and, uh, and that's where you get to. Uh, but So the, the alternative is that we go for hybrid. We, we mix batteries and engines. And I say there are some interesting trades there, because if you put a battery on and you use both the battery and the engine for takeoff, you can get away with smaller engines. So some of the weight of the battery is now offset by having a smaller engine, and you're not using as much fuel. Uh, particularly if you charge the battery on the ground before taking off, uh, then you don't need all the fuel for the battery, you only need the fuel for when you need the engine. So it, it starts to sort of come together, and this project, uh, Zunum that I mentioned, a 12-seater aircraft that Boeing have got very interest in, probably is the most advanced concept out there. It's going to fly 2020 or 2021. Uh, a company called Safran in France are developing the propulsion system, uh, it's a neat design in many ways. So it's got electric fans at the back, got the propulsion system sitting at the back. And then the batteries are actually in the wings where the fuel tanks would normally be. 
Uh, still got to leave a bit of room for the fuel, but uh, two advantages of that. One, you can, if you project forward and think this aircraft might have a life of 25 years, you can expect that the battery technology will improve considerably during that time, so you'll be able to increase the range of the aircraft using a battery you can buy in 10 years' time. So instead of throwing away the whole aircraft, you just drop out these batteries from the wings and fit new high-tech batteries, and off you go uh, twice the distance. Um, but secondly, if you don't want to wait at the airport at the other end to recharge your batteries, you could, in theory, just drop them out, put a new battery in, and immediately take off again and go to your next uh, journey point. So this, this has got a range of about 700 miles. So for so commuting in the U.S., it seems to make sense. There are lots and lots of small airstrips in the U.S., almost everywhere, uh, and just going from city to city with 12 people, uh, the economics look good as well. So this is a starting point, and then, you know, the, the question again is, can we scale that up? Is it scalable to a 200 or 300 seat aircraft? Uh, well, Boeing and Rolls-Royce did some studies on a big aircraft. This is an aircraft design called a blended wing body, which is extremely efficient aerodynamically as an aircraft, and that had two gas turbines either in the wings here generating the electricity, it had batteries on board, and then a very large number of small fans all along the rear of the aircraft propelling the aircraft forward. Only a concept, probably not realizable this side of 2030 or 2035, but nonetheless it did seem to wash its face. It's not breaking any laws of physics uh, and could be done. Uh, this is a demonstrator that's actually happening today that Rolls-Royce and Airbus and Siemens, Siemens are providing some of the electrical equipment are putting together. It's going to fly uh, for the first time in uh, about 2020 again. Uh, it's a modified existing aircraft, a BA-146. Uh, they chose that because it's a four-engine aircraft, one of the, the only small aircraft that has four engines. And if you're going to tell a pilot to get in a two-engine aircraft where one of them is a newfangled electrical engine <laughs> and the other one's the same old reliable mechanical engine he's used to, he's likely to walk away. Uh, whereas if you say, look, you've got three good engines and one electrical one, so even if something goes wrong with both the electrical one and one of your good engines, uh, then yeah, you'll still be all right. Uh, military pilots always had a saying that the advantage of being in a two-engine aircraft instead of a one-engine aircraft is if you're in a two-engine aircraft and one engine fails, you know you've got just enough power to get to the scene of the crash. Uh, <laughs> so this is a hybrid system, as I say, just one of the engines, conventional engines, replaced by uh, an electric motor. Uh, still actually the same fan as the, the main engine, but just driven now by an electric motor. Uh, a gas turbine, A2100 gas turbine, again a Rolls-Royce gas turbine in the back, driving a two megawatt generator, uh, through the power distribution and everything else, a two megawatt battery, and, you know, fly it and learn. That's the objective. It's not a practical design for carrying people, but it will teach us a lot about how to optimize uh, a, a, a hybrid system for the future. And as I say, that's due to, to fly around uh, 2020 or thereabouts. Hopefully in time for the Farm Brea show in 2020, but we'll wait and see. And then... If you really want to look into the future, this is a bit of work uh, we did that, that I sponsored when I was still with Rolls-Royce. Uh, we got together with Airbus and said, well, let's just, you know, say we want to do this. We want to make the world's best hybrid aircraft. It's got to carry 200 people. Don't be limited by today's technology, but don't break any laws of physics. Those are the two rules we set the team. And actually, the team was mostly students from Cranfield University uh, with a bit of help from Cambridge. And they did a fantastic job, produced this rather wonderful design of an aircraft with one big gas turbine at the back, generating electricity and some thrust for the aircraft, six electric fans distributed three on either side, and not only producing power, but sucking down the boundary layer, like the earlier one I showed you, and re-energizing the boundary layer, and then somewhere in the hold here, a battery. Now, to make this, the engines light enough, it assumed we were going to get to that theoretical limit on the batteries by about 2035. It assumed we could make motors for the large engines, which were a fifth of the weight of today's motors. And the only way we know today of doing that is by using superconducting technology. And there are superconducting motors out there that are both a fifth of the weight and a fifth of the size for the equivalent power of a conventional motor. So again, not breaking laws of physics. We know how to do the physics. 
and that's what it looks like inside. There's the gas turbine at the back. Take up a bit of the baggage hold to, for, um, for the battery storage and these six uh, gas turbines. But th this is the sort of benefits you get from it. It does achieve those targets we set for 2050. It gets us there 70% uh, fuel saving, 75% uh, fuel saving, 90% reduction in NOx, and significant reduction in noise, partly because you haven't got all the jet noise and partly because you embed the fans, which are also a source of noise, inside the wings of the aircraft so the noise doesn't come out. And I'll just finish with a short video, if I may, and take you on a, a trip in this futuristic aircraft, assuming the video works, which it did earlier. three of the electric fans embedded in the, in the wing. There's the big gas turbine at the back, generating electricity but also generating some thrust. There's the gas turbine. the batteries sitting in the cargo hold and if you fasten your seat belts we're ready to take off so take off you're using the gas turbine and the power from the battery you've got all six motors turning and you've got the gas turbine turning and off you go into the air you see you use quite a bit of the power off the battery but it gets you up in the air when you're cruising you can you now don't need much of the power from the gas turbine, but you can use it to recharge the battery. So one of the constraints was you shouldn't need to charge on the ground. You should be able to land with an aircraft that the battery is fully charged and ready for the next flight. On the top of descent, as you come into uh, descent, you can be gliding. Uh, you don't need to use any energy at all. And actually, as you come down through the denser air, you use the fans now as generators, use them as windmills, spin them the other way and generate some electricity and again complete the charging of the battery totally for free. So something like 6% of the total power in an aircraft today is used in descent uh, and 50% uh, of that power can be saved in, the, in this uh, construct. And even when you land, uh, you could have regenerative braking like in a Toyota Prius so that slowing down the aircraft even on the ground just as that final top up for the aircraft so i hope you enjoyed that fairly short flight and uh you just stop the video there no. doesn't want to stop so to summarize you will see more electric aircraft by 2025, some of them you may be bobbing around Disneyland on one, uh, incommoding the passers-by. Some of you may even be summoning one, summoning one for your Uber ride, or you may have one just for a hobby for taking you and your partner over to Paris for a day out and then coming back again. But you won't, the number of this pe people in this audience neither in a hybrid aircraft or in a battery-powered aircraft by 2025 will be flying electrically, I can safely predict. If you want to go with Zunum, you may be able to take yourself and a few friends in a hybrid aircraft and travel 700 miles in relative comfort and uh, do that partly electrically. By 2035, you still won't be able to fly totally electrically in a large aircraft, but you could have a hybrid aircraft with all the technology I've just talked about, and that seems to make uh, a lot of sense. And with that, I'll draw it to a close and happy to take some questions. Thank you very much.